Bridge Church, stand up and sing with us. has walked beside me the winter storms make way for spring in every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life All over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. That fear may come, but fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. I see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. I see the evidence of your goodness. All over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life. So why should I fear the evidence? Good morning. I'm glad you're inside where it's warm. It's kind of cold outside, but I'm okay with that. I like the cold. Who's with me? Yeah, they're weird with me. It's fine. God loves weird people. <laughs> no, that totally threw me off my welcome now. Um, <laughs> um, again, welcome to the Ridge. I'm so stoked that you guys are here. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about, especially this entire year, like people make resolutions and things. I'm not a big resolution maker. I'm more of a, what do I want to do with myself, which is actually a resolution now I think about it. Either way, um, <laughs> one thing that I was thinking about is how we want to strive for perfection. Like we want to be perfect. And I think a lot of times when we fail, we think that God won't accept us because of that. 
because we try and live up to this pedestal that we are never going to reach. I hate to break it to you. We will never reach the pedestal of perfection because only one person has ever done that. But that doesn't mean that God is not going to stop loving us. That doesn't mean that he's not going to stop caring for us. God chose tax collectors. God chose prostitutes. God chose the lowest of the lows. God took Saul, who was a persecutor, and turned him into Paul. God can use you where you are. You have to turn to him and say, God, here I am. Take me and use me how you want. So ponder on that as we continue through the service. from hell. It saves us from ourselves. Jesus' name is so 
just think that when we sing his name that we should not just sing it and just be done with it. It should it should do something to us. It should change us. Um, so I just pray that as we're singing these songs that that's, that's on your mind because sometimes it just um, it's easy to just sing his name and go on with it and not think about it just because that's what we do on Sunday. Jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. is jealous for me loves like a hurricane i am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden i am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so.
Father God, we come to you knowing that you do love us, Father. Knowing that the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who's put the stars in place, the God who makes everything go in motion, Father, you love us. Father, your word says that who shall separate us from the love of Christ, so tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Father, it says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything in all creation we have better separated us from your love, Father. I pray we meditate on those words. Father, you love us, and that is so awesome to hear. Father, be with us during this time and during this service. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, well, how are we doing, church? Good to see you guys. Hey, if you have a Bible with you, I want you to grab it and open it up to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. While you're turning there, I just want to remind you that uh, coming up on February the 4th, uh, which is next, or actually this coming Friday night, is Ladies' Night uh, here at the Ridge. And if you're not signed up for that, uh, today is the last day that you can do that. And so that'll be from 6.30 to 8.30 uh, this coming Friday night right here uh, at the Ridge. And they've got some things that are going to be uh, planned uh, for the evening. And so you need to RSVP for that, though. So uh, today's the last day that you can do that. So if you'll grab the Connect card in the seat there in front of you or just snap a picture of the QR code there on the front, you can use the digital Connect card. And uh, in the comment section, just make sure that you say, hey, I'd like to uh, come out to Ladies' Night uh, this Friday night so that you can RSVP for that, and we'll get that to uh, the right people. And so I'd like to, I'd like to begin today with a, a, a statement that won't shock anyone uh, when I actually say it. And so whether you embrace Christianity or not, most of us know that something is not right with the world. Like we, that doesn't surprise anyone. And so whether, uh, you know, whether you see it in yourself, like you look internally inside yourself and you think, you know what, uh, I know that there is something not right with me. Not in the head, that's most of us, right? But in our hearts, that's, that's, really, that's really all of us. Right, that something's not right, or maybe you see it in other people, or or or, or maybe you know you th- you think that those problems that exist in the world, when you look at the world and you say, you know what, something's not right in the world. When you look at the world and you see it, maybe you think, you know what, it's because of this, or it's because of that. It's a it's a lack of education. It's it's because of the the poverty that exists in the world. It's because of this. It's because of that. It's or or maybe you know if you were. If you are on, on the right, you look at the ideologies of the left, and you think, you know what, the reason why the world is what it is is because of the way that they think that way. Or maybe you're on the left, and you, you look at the, the right politically, and you, you think the same thing. It's, it's the ideologies that are, that are being taught politically in the world. That's what's wrong with the world. Or maybe you just see the world's problem as a breakdown of families right like and whatever it is like you you can you can try to pin it on all of those things we can we can pin it on and and we do that we do that like we do pin it on all of those things sometimes all of those things all at once sometimes just individually in and of themselves there's a, a secular theologian by the name of Steven Tyler and he actually I think put it best he said it this way he said something wrong with the world today and I don't know what it is Something wrong with our eyes. We're seeing things in a different way, and God knows it ain't his. It show ain't no surprise. That's Stephen Tyler from Aerosmith, by the way, just in case you don't know. Notice I said secular theologian. But I think we we all live with this sense that things are not the way that they're meant to be. Things are not the way that they're meant to be. 
Last week, uh, Sean Pennington uh, gave us an introduction and overview of Genesis chapter 3. And, and when you look at Genesis chapter 3, one thing that it certainly does is it brings up some questions that we need to answer before we move deeper into the whole story of God. This week, I, I want to take a deeper dive into Genesis 3 and unpack for us the concept of what we call theologically, we call the fall. We call the fall. Not like it's, you know, it's fall, y'all, pumpkin spice, s'mores, and bonfires. Not that kind of fall, but like theologically, spiritually speaking, the fall, as in the fall of mankind and the introduction of sin into humanity. Genesis 3 is the story of what went, has, and is going wrong with the world. And so when you look at the world and you think to yourself, you know what, there is something wrong with this world, Genesis 3, you trace it all back to here. It all traces back to this place. And the Bible, the Bible as we've said, right, we've said this over and over and over in this series as we'll continue to say forever, is one story told through different books and that one story, that one story is about Jesus. But you can actually take the Bible theologically and you can break it down into four different categories. You have creation, right? We actually covered that two weeks ago. We looked at, uh, at creation from Genesis chapter 1 and part of chapter 2. And then you have the fall, which is what we're going to look at today, what we looked at last week and this week. And then when we get to the New Testament, we have what we call redemption. That's when Jesus enters into uh, the scene physically. Jesus has always been there. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago as we see Jesus in the beginning of creation. And then in the end, when we get to Revelation, you have restoration. The return of Christ, when all things are restored, when wholeness is brought back together. And so a few weeks back, we looked at how God created, and that when God created the heavens and the earth, and he created everything in the heavens and the earth, he looked at his creation, and he said, it is good. It is good. But before all of that happened, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he, he, but when the heavens and the earth were created, before that actually happened, it was formless and, and void and, and full of darkness. And so the world actually begins in chaos. It begins out of order. Then God speaks light into creation, and he brings all of that chaos into order. Everything that was dark now is filled with light. Everything that was formless now has form to it. Everything that was chaotic now is brought back in to order. And so from the very beginning, God's plan A, as we've said every week in this series, God plan, God's plan A was always Jesus. Jesus was there in the beginning. John chapter 1 puts it this way. John writes this, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so he hearkens back to that very beginning of creation to say that Jesus always has been. He wasn't created. Jesus has always been with God. Jesus is God. And so just like the world was dark and in chaos, so is and was our hearts before Jesus. But just like God spoke light into the chaos, so Jesus comes into our lives as light to bring to order our hearts that are in chaos. And so God creates it all. He creates it all, the land, the sea, the heavens, the animals, and eventually, in the order of creation, eventually humanity enters into creation. He creates Adam, or Adam. Right? He creates Adam, and out of Adam, he creates Eve. So God creates all of this, but before he actually creates Eve, he, he gives Adam his first command. He gives, and we looked at this last week, but Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17 says this. It's the first command given in scriptures. And it says this. It says, the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. And so not only does God give Adam a command, he says, you, you can eat of any tree here except for that one. Not that one. 
He says, you can't have anything from that tree. And then he gives them a warning. He says, because if you do, you will die. Now, what God means by you will certainly die isn't necessarily a quick and, you know, just death immediately and automatically. One of the things that we see in the creation story and through the book of Genesis is that Adam actually lives to be about 930 years old. That's a long time, right? I don't know how that works. It just that's it's what it is, right? So, but it says that he lives to be 930 years old, and so he doesn't die immediately. As we, we know what happens. Most of us know what happens here in Genesis chapter 3, but he does die physically. That's not the way that the world was meant when God created it. There wasn't meant to be physical death. There wasn't meant to be spiritual death until the fracturing of humanity through the fall. And so to this point, to this point, up to this point, God says it had been good. But when he noticed that Adam was not made to be alone, he created Eve. And then on the seventh day, the scriptures say that he rested. And when he rested, he said it was very good. It was very good. Anybody love a good nap? It's very good. Amen? Right? God rested and he said it was very good. And so we have what what the Bible calls shalom. It's peace. It's, it, it's a different kind of peace. It's not like, you know, give me five minutes of peace away from my children kind of peace. Like it is a, a peace that surpasses all understanding, this shalom or, or what uh, the Bible describes as, as this peace that brings wholeness, that takes what is fractured and broken and, and, and brings this peace. There was no fracturing. There was no brokenness up to this point when we are into Genesis chapter 2. And so it's not until we turn the page into Genesis chapter 3 that everything falls apart. And so that brings us to Genesis 3. And I, I just simply want to answer three questions for us today. I want to answer these three questions. What is the fall? What are the effects of the fall? And what is God's response to the fall? What is the fall? What are the effects of the fall? And what is God's response? And so what is the fall? Let's look at Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1, and it says this. It says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you can eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Now, notice, and this is actually, we're going to look at this next week. We're actually going to look at the serpent and and Satan and his schemes against us next week. So that's a whole other sermon for next week. But I want you to notice this because it's really important. Satan begins his questioning to the woman with, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And notice what Eve responds with. She says this, she said, God said you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. And and Satan, as he always does, his only tool is to be an accuser and a liar. And so he comes at Eve and he's like, yeah, but I mean, did he really say that you can't eat it or touch it? He's twisting God's words. But again, we'll look at that in depth next week. And this is what it says. It says, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. That's what Eve says. I'm quoting God. This is what he said to us. Verse 4, Satan says, no, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. Uh, today's going to feel a little bit more like Bible study than a sermon, okay? So I want you to just follow along with me here. In fact, if you have your YouVersion Bible app, you've got all, the, all of today's notes uh, inside of that. But verse 6 is interesting because in verse 6, here's what we see. If you look at verse 6, every sin we all struggle with can actually be traced back to this point right here in verse 6. Notice what, what it says. It says, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. That's what we call lust of the flesh. 
When you see something physically and you say, you know what, I want that. I got to have that. But no, 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 but you're not supposed to have that. Doesn't matter. I want it. It's called lust of the flesh, right? And then it says, and it was delightful to look at. That's what we call lust of the eye, right? And then the third, third one, it says, she saw that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. That's what we call the pride of life, the pride of life. Or essentially, you could say it like this, money, sex, and power. The, the root of all sin can almost flow right back into those three places. Money, sex, and power. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And so it says here in verse 7, or it says that she took some of it and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband. And in verse 7 it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, the easy thing to do here would to be to, to look at this and to look what happened here and think for just a moment. Let's, let's think about what happens. Satan comes along, or the serpent comes along, which is Satan, comes along, deceives Eve, right? Deceives her, twists God's words around. She falls for it, and she takes from the tree the fruit, which... By the way, we don't know if it was an apple or not, okay? So, like, like don't, don't be like, she took the apple and ate it. We don't know if it was an apple. It says it was a fruit. Could have been a star fruit, for all we know. Like, we don't know, right? Watermelon. Who knows? But well, it wouldn't come off of a tree. But anyway, nevertheless, right? Like, it was a fruit. Could have been a tomato, right? I mean, who knows? So, anyway, uh, it says it took of a fruit. So she takes the fruit and she eats it, and then when she eats it, she gives it to Adam, and Adam eats it, right? So who's at fault here? Both. Yeah, very good. Both. And some of y'all were like, uh-uh, it's that woman's fault, right? That's what Adam actually says later on. He's like, he's, God's like, hey, what happened here? That woman, she gave me that fruit. It's all her fault, right? And then Eve blame shifts as well, but that's, we'll talk about that later. They are both at fault. They are both at fault. And so what was, what was Adam doing? See, a- Adam, Adam is actually just as guilty as Eve in this moment. What, what was Adam doing? Well, he wasn't grilling and killing like he was supposed to be doing, right? He was t- told by God to cultivate and subdue, work the ground and watch over it. That's what God, was, that's what God actually commanded Adam to be doing, but that is not what he was doing. He's hanging out with Eve, right? He's listening to uh, being deceived as well. And so what you have is you have two sins that are committed here. Eve commits a sin of what we call the sin of commission, in that she did what they were told not to do. That's what we call sin of commission. Like she, she did what she was told not to do. Adam is actually guilty of what we call the sin of omission, right? In that he did not do what he ought to do, which was to intervene. He didn't do what he should have done when he should have said, no, 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 stop. This is, this is what God told me. And, and remember, the command given to them was actually given to Adam. It wasn't given to Eve. It was given to Adam before Eve was ever created. And so, therefore, it was Adam's responsibility to make sure that God's command was followed and lived out by them. And yet, he stood by and was like, oh, maybe that fruit is, that does look pretty good, actually. Let's give that a shot. Let's see what happens here. And so he is deceived as well. And so Eve commits the sin of commission where Adam commits a sin of omission. And we can trace all of our current sin issues back to this moment in history when Adam and Eve shattered the shalom in the garden. And from that moment, all of humanity would be fractured. You'll hear me say this often is, is that we inherently have this sin problem in our lives. And what I mean by that, like to inherently have something means that you have inherited that. That is something that has been passed on and passed down to you. And when I say that we are inherently sinners, this is why. 
from the very beginning, the first humans on the earth. And you might be, wait, wait, hold on, stop a minute. I don't really, I don't know, like, we don't really know if they were the first humans on earth. I don't know if I believe that. Well, here's the thing. This is just my opinion. You are free to make it yours if you want. I believe it because Jesus believed it, and he died and then rose from the grave and is alive. I'm going with him, okay? So he believed it, I believe it, all right? First humans on earth, inherently, it is passed on to us. This sin issue. We have it because they broke it. It is given to us by them, and so it can all be traced back to this moment. Adam and Eve rejected God's rule over them. We call this this rebellious choice, but this is what we call it the fall. And so this moment in history, when we talk about the fall, this is what we're talking about, and because they represented all of humanity, their actions affect us as well. Their actions affect us. And so we have, through our attitudes and actions, we have declared ourselves to be God's enemies. This rebellion results in physical and spiritual death for us today. Why? Because that's the result that they got. And we'll see this as we continue through Genesis 3, is that that the uh, effects of the fall are are thus that. They, They experience spiritual death. They experience a physical death later on, as well as some other things. And so, again, what about, what about this serpent? What part does he play in this? We're going to look at that in depth next week. All right? So I hope you'll come back next week for that. We're going to look at that next week. And so the second question is this. What, what then are, if this is the fall, what are the effects of the fall? Like, what are the effects of the fall? Look at verse 9. It says this. It says, So the Lord God called out to them, or called to the man, and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And I love how this, this sort of plays out as if God doesn't already know. Like, don't you do this with your kids, parents? Like, don't we do this? It's like, who did that? Right? Like, who was it that did that? You know, and, and they've got the evidence all over their face and hands, Right? and you're just you're playing the game you're like hey why don't you tell me who did this right and you know who did it god knows who god knows what's going on here but he asked him he says who told you that you were naked did you eat from the tree that i commanded you not to eat from and the man replied here here it comes here 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 is the moment like this is the moment that sort of solidifies the fall for us and for them in this moment because in this moment Adam had a choice to make. Adam had a choice to be able to confess and say, hey, you know what? Yes, I did. I am guilty of this. I confess and I repent. Instead, what he does is he shifts the blame. This is what he says. He says, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Now, again, once again, parents... You know how this works. And everybody in the room knows how this, how this works because you were a child at one point too, right? Like when this happens, when you do something and yet you blame it on something, like you blame it on someone else, right? This is that moment in history where the phrase, the devil made me do it, comes from, right? The devil didn't make you do it. You chose to do it, right? Adam chose to eat the fruit. The devil didn't make him do it. Did the devil tempt him? Sure. We are all tempted, but we all choose to fall into temptation. And so he shifts the blame. He's like, it's not my fault. I, I didn't do this. Is This woman that you gave me, what Adam is actually doing, think about what the words that Adam actually says. Adam's actually blaming God for this. The woman that you gave me. I wouldn't have done this if you didn't give me this woman. This is your fault. How often do we do this? How often do we do this as humans? Not only shift the blame, but ultimately in some way try to blame God for the choices that we make. God, if you hadn't have done this, if this hadn't have happened, God, if you didn't allow this, then I wouldn't have done this. It is the same thing that Adam is doing here. 
Verse 13, it says, so the Lord God asked the woman. Notice that he doesn't even respond <laughs> to Adam's, well, it's your fault. Like, like a good parent, like a good father, he just looks and is like, hmm. So how about you, right? He says, so the Lord God asked the woman, what is this that you have done? And what does she do? She does the same thing. She doesn't own it. She doesn't confess it. She shifts the blame. She said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. There are three main effects of the fall. You can write these down, or if you're taking notes uh, or following along in your version app, you'll see these. But there are three main effects of the fall. We, there's a lot of effects, but we're just going to categorize them into these three areas. Internal, external, and eternal. Internal, external, and eternal. The first one is the, the internal effects of the fall. And, and in the internal effects of the fall, the very first thing that you see is you see shame and guilt. And so for the very first time in humanity, the world would experience shame and guilt. And come on, church, true or, true or false, we've been experiencing this ever since. Shame and guilt. Look at verse, you don't have to go back, let me just read it to you, but in verse 7, this is where we see it takes place. It says, then the eyes of both of them were open. In other words, they saw it and they experienced it and they felt it for the very first time and they knew that they were naked. Translation, shame and guilt. And so what did they do? They made fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves because they were feeling shameful and guilty for what they had done. So we have this internal effect of shame and guilt because of the fall. And then secondly, the other thing that you see internally is you see broken relationship with God. Broken relationship with God. Verse 10, it says, God asked, or it said, I heard you in the garden, and I, or this is Adam actually, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, because I was shameful and guilty, and so I hid. I hid from God. Now again, this was not the way it was meant to be, and this is not the way that it had been up to this moment. When Adam would hear the voice of God, when Adam knew that God was near, Adam would run to God to be with God and not afraid of God and didn't care you know, whether he was clothed or not clothed. He didn't feel shame and guilt, but now all of a sudden he feels shameful and guilty, and as a result of that, he hides from God, therefore breaking relationship with God. And they hid because of this shame and guilt. Hiding, guilt, shame, broken relationship with God, it all goes together. It all goes together. And so we now, naturally, we have, all of us, every single one of us, we all naturally have this fear of being found out, right? Whether it's being exposed to God or exposed to someone, someone else, because of the fall, because of Genesis 3, because of the effects of the fall, because of shame and guilt and broken relationship with God, we all have this fear. We all live within this fear. And so what do we do? We hide from God. But answer this question for yourself. Are you really hiding from God? Are you really hiding from God? When God calls out to Adam and says, where are you? Do you think he's like doing that because he actually doesn't know where they are? Right? It's like playing hide and go seek with your two-year-old. They're not doing that good of a job, right? But you'll play the game. Hey, where are you? And you see little feet sticking out from underneath the covers, Right? God knew where they were, but they thought, they thought, no, I, I feel too much shame. I feel too much guilt. I don't want to be found out. I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to experience this with God. I messed up. I broke a command that God gave me, and so therefore now I, I need to get away from God because now they are fearful of God in a way that God did not design them to be fearful of him. They are fearful as in afraid, uh, afraid, run, and hide, where they were meant to be fearful as in awe. And we've been experiencing this ever since. And so we now naturally have this fear of being found out, but nothing, nothing will make us feel more lonely 
than hiding and especially hiding from God. And so because of sin, instead of confession, we hide and we experience guilt and shame. And these are the, the major internal effects of the fall. But not only are there internal effects of the fall, there are external effects of the fall. Look at verse 16. Verse 16, it says this. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains, and you will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all of the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. And so for the woman, there are external effects. Overall, to man and woman and to all of humanity, there is now pain and suffering. But specifically, to women, God says there would be pain in childbirth. And so ladies, it is not our fault. You can thank Eve for that, okay? So quit blaming us. We didn't do it. You got to take it easy. Right? But for the men, for the men, it would be the pain, sweat, and toil in work. Now, you have to be careful here because this is, this is really important. There's some, there's some important nuances within this text that if you're not careful, you will misunderstand. For, for example, verse 17, it says, Because you listened to your wife. Men, that is not a good reason to not listen to your wife, okay? So don't, you, don't use that. Be like, hey, you see what happened to Adam, so like, not listening to you, okay? It's not going to work for you, I promise. All right, But the other thing that you have to be careful about here is you can't look at this text and you go, you see, God didn't, it, it, is, it is not biblically correct to work. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. Genesis chapter 2, we already read it, but what command did God give to Adam? He says he placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. Work is actually something that is given to us by God. It is something that is ordained by God. The result of the fall is that as we work, work will now be hard, and sometimes painful, and sometimes long, and sometimes feel like suffering. Like, hey, believe me, I get it. I'm going to suffer tomorrow when I go to work. This is the result of the fall. This is an external result of the fall. It's all, and, and it all has to do with, with pain and suffering. You see, work is not a result of the fall. Work was already instituted by God, and God sets a strong work ethic for us to follow in the creation story. The result is that when we work, it will be hard, tiring, and sometimes painful. But yet for both, for Adam, for Eve, for us externally, they would experience a physical death as well. No longer would they live forever physically, they would also experience a physical death. And so we die in this life thanks to Adam and Eve's sin. And so the root of all pain and suffering we experience in this life can also be traced back to here. Do you see where we're going with this? Do you see, you see how everything comes back to Genesis chapter 3? You see how everything in humanity, all the pain and suffering that we experience in this present age, in your life, personally, can all be traced back to here. All back to this moment. And so there's an internal effect, there's an external effect, and then there is also an eternal effect. Verse 15, it says this. This is God speaking. This is what he says. He says, I will put hostility between you and the woman. And and he's speaking to Satan here, by the way. He says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, some people call this the first gospel 
preached. And what it is, it is a foreshadowing of what Jesus will do on the cross. Look at verse 21. Verse 21, it says this, it says, The Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. Now, this is important in the concept of this and in this eternal effect. This is essentially the gospel. And so there, there are consequences to their sin. They deserved a spiritual death for rebelling against God. Yes, absolutely. But they did not get what they deserved. Instead, he clothes them physically, but also spiritually with grace and mercy. Notice, and here's, here's the, the key thing. This is why I read 21 to you, that it says that he clothed them. Notice before Adam and Eve, it says that they clothed themselves by, by sewing fig leaves together. God clothes, he gives them clothing that is different. It says that he gives them clothing made from skins of animals, animal skins. Now, why, why is that important? You see, an animal, for the first time, as far as we know, had to die in order to atone for and cover the sins of another. It's a sacrifice. Now, it would be later on, we'll look at this in a few weeks, later through Moses that God would institute animal sacrifices to atone for sin. We'll, we'll talk about that more in depth, but, but here is where we see this second shadow of Jesus, if you will. The first is, is light into the darkness in the creation account, and the second is here in a sacrifice to actually pay for sin. An animal had to die. There had to be a sacrifice made in order to atone for or to cover sin. And so again, what are the effects of the fall? You have an internal, external, and eternal effect. And so what then, what is God's response? How does God respond to all of this? Don't miss this. This is really important. Even though they rebelled and disobeyed, God's response is that he actually comes to look for them. He pursues them. He doesn't run away from them. He doesn't push them off to the side. He doesn't say, you know what? You messed up. I'm done with you. I gave you a command. You broke it. We're done here. It's not what he does. He comes after them. He comes looking for them. He pursues them. So don't ever forget this. You, like if you're, a, if you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christian, you did not find God. You did not find God. He was not the one that was lost. You were. I was. God doesn't need to be found. He's, he's right where he's always been. Adam and Eve... They hid. It says that they hid from God. But who came looking for them? They didn't go looking for God. God came for them. He came looking for them. He's not the one that's hiding. Verse 8, it says, The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then in verse 8, Nine, it says, God called out to the man and said to them, where are you? You see, God pursuing his creation and doing whatever it takes to cover our sin, and he would, he would do this again in Christ Jesus. He did it here in the beginning, and he would do it again in Christ Jesus. And so let me ask you, who among us has not ran and hid from God? That would be every single one of us. It would be every single one of us. I know that I certainly have, and if I'm being honest with you, I likely will again. So Genesis 3, however, it is just a shadow of the gospel. It is a shadow of the gospel. If you remember from, from Genesis chapter 1 when we started this series and, and when we did sort of a, a precursor to this series, I told you to always ask this question, where is Jesus in the text? Where is Jesus in the text? Every time you read the Bible, every time you open it up, ask yourself this question. It doesn't matter if you're reading Malachi chapter 1 or John chapter 10. Where is Jesus in the text? Can you see it? Can you see Jesus in this text? 
It's, it's right here. How God pursues us for relationship, even though we rebel against God and run and hide from Him, He still comes for us. Why? Because He loves us. Because He loves us. He loves you. He loves me. God, what He does is He covers sin with a garment here, but with Jesus, He doesn't just cover sin with a garment. He takes away sin and washes us clean. How many of us are tired of trying to cover our own sin and trying to work off our spiritual debt? That's not the way that it works. It's not the way that, notice that, that God doesn't tell them, hey, you, you want to you get, get back into relationship with me? Then, then work, work hard. Do this, do that. There's no set of you do this, you do that. He gives them consequences, right? We talked about those, internal, external, eternal. There are consequences. And the greatest consequence, the greatest consequence that anyone would ever feel would not be Adam and Eve, would not be you and I. The greatest consequence that anyone would feel would be God himself. In giving his only son, in giving Jesus as a sacrifice, as an atonement, to take away our sins. I love this. Um, I love this Jesus Storybook Bible. If you have young children, I, I highly encourage you to get one of these. It's a it's a great uh, paraphrase of the Bible uh, and stories in the Bible. It has uh, it has pictures, so I'm I'm in, right? It's good. Some great, some great illustrations in this. But it takes the Bible, it takes the Bible in a very uh, accurate way, but an artful way, okay? So, and it explains, explains the Bible in, in a way that points everything back to Jesus. In every story. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And so I, I encourage you parents to, to, to get this if you have young children. And if you're just an adult and you just want, like get it, because I, I love reading this thing. I think it's great. But I want to read you part of the account from Genesis chapter 3 here, from the Jesus Storybook Bible. It says this. It says, But before they left the garden, God made clothes for his children to cover them. He gently clothed them, then he sent them away on a long, long journey, out of the garden, out of their home. Well, In another story, it would all be over, and that would have been the end. But, not in this story. God loved his children too much to let the story end there. Even though he knew he would suffer, God had a plan, a magnificent dream. One day, he would get his children back. One day, he would make the world their perfect home again. And one day, he would wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And though they would forget him and run from him, deep in their hearts, God's children would miss him always and long for him. Lost children longing for their home. Before they left the garden, God whispered a promise to Adam and Eve. It will not always be so. I will come to rescue you. And when I do, I'm going to do battle against the snake. I'll get rid of the sin and the dark and the sadness you let in here. I'm coming back for you. And he would. One day, God himself would come. See, Genesis 3 is all of our story. It's my story. It's your story. It is all of our story. I don't know if this explains what is going on in your heart. I, maybe, maybe this helps. Maybe this sheds some light. At least, if not within your own heart, maybe you can look at humanity now and you can actually answer the question, what is wrong with people? This. 
This is what's wrong with us. This is what is wrong with the world. This is what's wrong with you. This is what's wrong with me. This is what's wrong with every bad and evil thing that you see in humanity. Like I, before I understood this, I would see things in the news sometimes and I would just shake my head and just go, man, unbelievable. I can't believe people would do that. I'm not surprised by anything anymore. Nothing surprises me. The worst evils in the world don't surprise me anymore. Are they awful? Are they horrible? Absolutely, yes. I hate to see them. They're sad. And they hurt your heart. But at the very core of those things, I can look at those things and I can go, but I know why. I know why. So maybe this helps explain what's going on in your own heart. But let me ask you, can, can you admit, can you admit that you are a dark-hearted sinner and we all have the commonalities of Adam and Eve? Have you realized that, that God is looking for you? Just like he was looking for Adam and Eve. Have you sensed that in your heart? His spirit chasing you, his voice calling out to you. I believe that... Even if you aren't aware of those things, I, I would simply say this, is that you're here in this room this morning for a reason. We say this all the time. We don't believe that you ever end up here by accident. We don't believe that you ever end up here without a purpose because God has a purpose for you being here. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, not what I've said, but what God has said for you, you've heard his voice calling out to you, that's why you're here. God sent his son Jesus on a rescue mission for you. For you. I'm not talking about the person sitting next to you. I'm not talking about just the people that were up here on this stage. For you. When Jesus died on the cross, it was for you. John 3.16 For God so loved the what? World. Take out world and put your name in there. For God so loved you. For God so loved Bobby. For God so loved you that whoever believes, that's me, that's you, that's anyone, will not die but will have eternal life. Speaking of this spiritual life that, that God gives to each and every single one of us, that is God's rescue mission for us, Him sending Jesus because of Genesis 3. Because of, this is the fall. This is the fall. And so as, as Christ followers, maybe, maybe you, you've, heard, you've heard this, you've heard God's voice, and, and this is, is what led you to, to give your life to him. And so you are a Christ follower. You are a Christian. You have been saved by Jesus. How do we respond to this? We respond out of worship, out of adoration of God, out of thankfulness because of what he did for us. And so we worship. We're going to sing a song together here in just a moment and have a moment to worship together. And it's a moment for us to respond in praise and thanksgiving. But if you are not a Christ follower, you've never given your life to Christ, you've never asked Jesus to save you, this is an, a moment for you to do just that. Because Genesis, Genesis 3, it's, it's, it's in me, it's in you too. And you, 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 can, you can look at this and be like, nah, I'm good. Like I've done pretty, I've, I've, I've skated by, I've, I've hid myself away from God. No, you haven't. <laughs> No, you haven't. And I believe that you're here in this room or listening to this podcast or watching this on YouTube, whatever it is, to hear that Jesus loves you and wants you. All your junk to. It's like, well, what do I do with that? Don't worry about that. God takes care of that. That happens in time. He loves you and he wants you so you give your life to him. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we just thank you for the opportunity to be able to to have a picture and a glimpse of what is wrong with every single one of us. Why we are the way that we are, why we feel what we feel, why we experience what we experience. God, through your word, you've given us a picture of that to help us hopefully understand a little more. And if anything else, maybe we at least just understand why you have done what you've done. Why you had to to give Jesus. So Father, I just pray across the room that for every every believer in the room, God, God, that you just you fill their hearts with your spirit, God, and that you just well up within them a, a spirit of thankfulness and praise and thanksgiving to be thankful for what you have done. That you could have just given us the consequences with no restoration, with no redemption. But you gave us redemption through your son, Jesus. And Father, I pray for anyone in the room, God, that has not yet been saved. God, that that has not yet began to follow you, Father. God, I pray that you just speak gently to their soul, loudly if you need to. God, that you would call them and save them. That they would, God, just pray to you and say, Jesus, save me, forgive me. We'll figure out the details later. You'll figure them out, God. You, It is up to you how you grow us. So, Father, I just pray that, that you do what only you can do. That's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand to your feet for just a moment? We're going to sing this song together. And again, it's just a moment to respond. As a Christ follower, that you respond with thanksgiving and praise. And if you are not yet a Christ follower, I would just encourage you to, to, do, to do this, to, to simply just pray and just to say, Jesus, save me. It's like, is that it? Is that, is that all I do? Yeah, for now, you just, you just pray. You just talk to him. Like, I'm not going to give you words to say because they're words that come from your heart to his. And so you speak those words. You talk to God. And as we do so, we just invite you to take communion together. You know, we talked about this, this sacrifice. This is, this is the picture of Jesus' sacrifice, of God's sacrifice. The body of Christ, the blood of Christ, the cracker represents his body broken, his b- juice, the, the blood shed on the cross. And so as Christ followers, we take communion. It says to to remember Jesus' sacrifice. So we we come to the table. But before we come to the table, everybody in the room, you don't have to be a member here at Ridge Church to take communion. You do need to be a Christ follower. And so maybe you just prayed for the first time, Jesus save me. You are now a Christ follower. You are now part of the family. You get to take communion. And so we take communion. But before we do so, we... We just ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins. And then we come to the table with clean hands, clean hearts. We have nothing on our conscience that we've not laid before the Lord. So we invite you to come when you're ready. Just again.
church, we want to we want to help you take a next step if if that is something that you feel the Lord is is calling you to, uh, whether that be uh, just to. Um, for prayer, uh, to have us uh, pray with you or pray for you about something, or uh, maybe it's that, that you pray to, to ask Jesus to save you today. We would love to hear that from you. We would love to be able to, uh, to give you some resources to help you in that new journey and walk, or, or maybe it was just to, um, you know, the Lord spoke something different to you. Whatever that is, we'd love to hear from you, and you grab that Connect card there in front of you, and you can use that. You can grab a pen in the seat back and fill that out, and on your way out, there's be some ushers there with some baskets. You can drop that in the basket there, uh, or just snap a picture of that QR code there and, and fill out the digital Connect card, but don't leave here without letting us know how we can pray with you, or if you have a question or something that you want to know, or maybe it's to be baptized or uh, get involved in a small group or, or begin to volunteer, whatever that maybe that connect card is, is how you do that. And ladies, don't forget, ladies not coming up this Friday night. Uh, be sure to use the connect card to RSVP for that. So we're going to give together on our way out as well. If you're new here at Rich Church, we're just so glad that you're here. Thanks for being here today. Uh, we don't want you to feel obligated at all to give. Your presence is is all that we're excited about. Uh, we're just glad that you're here. We will, uh, would love for you to fill out a Connect card if you get a chance. We have a free gift for you outside uh, this table right here outside the doors there. Uh, so be sure to drop that card off there, and, and we've got a gift for you uh, for being here today. It's a pretty fun little gift bag, so uh, be sure to grab one of those. But for everybody else, we'll give together as we leave. Uh, we're seeing the doxology together on our way out, but you can go to ridgegive.com, and you can give online, or you can give uh, in the baskets on the way out as well. So let's sing the doxology together as a Last reminder as to where our blessings come from, and then you are dismissed. Love you, church. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly Have a great week.